Where's the Lake of Gennesaret? And why did Jesus need a boat anyway? That's what we're going to talk about today in Luke 5. Jesus started his ministry. We heard it last time. He was going to the synagogues. He was healing people. He was talking to them about the word of God and amazing people. I wonder sometimes if that amazing wasn't like the good kind of amazing. But we pick up Luke 5, starting out where the crowd was all around him. And he was standing on the edge of Lake Gennesaret, which is another name for the Sea of Galilee. We have many names for many places. And it was even called the Sea of Tiberias. Tiberius is the uh, new emperor of Rome right now. So we just keep naming the same things over again. It's still the Sea of Galilee. And it says that he was by the edge and the crowd was about him. I mean, you're healing people and making the blind see and tossing out demons. Of course, people are going to crowd around you because that's exciting stuff. And fishermen had gone out with them, you know, into the sea and were washing their nets. So It's like the end of the day, and so you're going to take all the things that you have and make sure that they're cared for, you know, wash the nets, fold them up nicely, do all the nice things. So it's the end of the fishing day. He got into one of the boats, which was Peter's boat, and asked Peter if he could put out into the sea a little bit away from the land. And this was a method so people could hear him, right? So if he could go out, the people could crowd around on the edge of the sea And he could talk to many people without him getting squished and then his uh, sandals getting all wet from getting squished into the sea. And so he sat down and taught people from the boat. And when he stopped speaking, he said to Simon, and because we're calling him Simon, go ahead and put down your nets again. And Simon's like, I just washed these nets. They're all folded up nicely. We have worked all day and we didn't get anything anyway. And we are done with our day. But he says, oh, because you said so, I'm going to put the nets down again. And so then they got a large number of fish, so much that it was breaking their net. That's a lot of fish because they were prepared to be, because this was their job, fishermen. So they were going to get a lot of them. And so the boat was filled with fish and began to sink. And when Peter saw this, Simon Peter, and Peter bows down to him and says, leave me, I'm a sinful man. Oh, Lord. I mean, he knew this was God. And they were astonished because the catch of the fish was so large. Also there, because they were also fishermen, were the son of James and John, the son of Zebedee, who were also partners with Simon. So now we got the full picture. It wasn't just two groups of two fishermen that we saw, Andrew and Peter, and then James and John. They all worked together in partners. And so they They were all there together. And Jesus said to Simon, Peter, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to be catching men. You know, then Matthew, it said the fisher of men. And they brought in their boats and left everything and followed him. I mean, this is amazing. We talked a little bit in Matthew about how it mentions that there were some there that were his disciples. Someone brought out the interesting point that Simon says, Master, we'd toiled all night. We had been fishing all night. And that Luke, very frequently is going to bring up the word teacher, master, when it comes to his disciples and his apostles and the relationship with Jesus. This was a common relationship in that time. You saw it in like temple where it had leaders and rabbis who had a following. You see it in John the Baptist, who was the leader of many people who followed him. This was a common relationship. So by calling him teacher or master, it is saying, I'm bound to you. I am I am your student. Teach me what you know. And Luke points this out all the time. And what's nice too, I think, about the story is it gives a little bit more breath into how his first four apostles come to him. We get a little bit more of the story, a little bit more of the picture. And so we know, I guess, in a sense, that Luke is gathering more than just Mark. Mark's explanation was very simple, was very plain. We didn't hear any details about it. So we know that he is talking to many people about what had happened. Jesus used Simon's boat also as a tool for himself. Someone in the commentaries was bringing out that whatever it is you have, if you have a microphone, God is going to use that microphone. If you have a keyboard, and a computer, 
God's going to use that computer and a keyboard. If you're a musician, he's going to use your voice. If, you know, whatever it is you have, in this case, Simon had a boat, God was going to use that boat for his good. And he was going to talk in a way that people around would understand him. Whatever you have, God will use when you give it to God to be used. That if we let God into our work, into our occupations, just like Peter let Jesus in to his fishing, we're going to gain so much more. We're going to have so much more fruit from our work because we let Jesus into it. It's very nice. Man was full of leprosy. Luke was a doctor, and so he knew about leprosy, but it's not quite the way we understand diseases. When you see someone at that time with a skin illness, it was all called leprosy. They said that somewhere between three and 15 diseases were leprosy. But the reason you became outcast and you were told to stay away from town by a certain number of meters or that you weren't supposed to come near other people is because the form of leprosy we think of leprosy was not only deadly, but it was just gory. You died in a very slow, painful way. And no one wanted that to break out among other people, particularly if you had leprosy. You didn't want other people to catch it. So a man had leprosy, and he asked Jesus, if, if, if it's in your will, will you clean me? A lot of times people confounded illness with sin. And I think the temple structure the synagogue structure didn't divert away from that. We hear that too, right? We, there's even like health and wealth ministers out there who will say, you got sick because your faith wasn't good enough. You know, people will do that to other people. And so they probably have told him his whole life, you are unclean. He was unclean from a health point of view, from a safety point of view. He, he says, reach out your hand. Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. and he was healed. The leprosy was gone from him. And he says, go show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded. I said this the last time too. No one got cured from leprosy. He was probably the first guy who showed up and said, see, I'm clean. I'm going to do that ritual. And everyone's like, no, no one does that ritual. But he was that first guy. And it says that the reports went out. We know that that guy was told not to say anything, but he couldn't help in his joy to say something. And so again, Jesus went off to pray in a desolate place. Luke emphasizes Jesus and prayer, that he removes himself from areas so that he can be alone and pray. Jesus is teaching us how to live our lives, but as a human being, in a mortal sense, prayer is important for Jesus as well. Guy was paralyzed, and the Pharisees and the teachers were all there. And they were in a town, you know, because it said that everyone was coming from all the areas of Galilee, the Judea, the southern kingdom, Jerusalem. And people were coming to see him because now the word is getting out. And everyone's like, what's going on here? So they are all standing around watching Jesus. And there was a man who was paralyzed. And because they couldn't bring this person in, I think Matthew didn't give very much detail. Mark gave a little bit more detail. But what they did is they went through the tiles in the ceiling and lowered him down. Probably not destructive. The roof was probably meant to come apart. And so they lowered the man and he says, you know what? Your sins are forgiven. And boy, the scribes, those are going to be the educated people. And the Pharisees, those are going to be people. They were kind of middle, lower class people who were knowledgeable or dedicated to following every rule God said. We're suddenly like, wait a minute, this is blasphemy. Nobody forgives sin except for God. Jesus, it says, could read their minds. He knew what they were thinking. Why do you have these questions? Jesus knew their heart. What is easier, someone to forgive your sins or for someone to say, rise and walk? I'm doing the harder thing. I'm forgiving this man's sin because the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. And then he said to the paralyzed guy, get up, take your mat or your bed. They brought the whole bed and go home. And immediately he left. And it says that they were amazed and praising God. And they were all just, it said, seized with amazement. And they glorified God saying with awe, we have seen extraordinary things today. 
or I was watching The Chosen and one of the people there said, you know, this is the second most amazing thing I've seen today. That's kind of funny because when you're with Jesus, you're going to see amazing things all day long. Jesus goes up to a tax collector named Levi, our friend Matthew, sitting at the booth and said, follow me. He left everything and followed him. Again, this area of Capernaum, this, he would have been in that area, is not that big. So Levi would have seen and heard of Jesus being talked about, maybe even saw him himself. But I think it's interesting, as I thought it was before, that there are certain people Jesus just comes up to and says, follow me. And they do. There's other people that come up to him and he poses to them the one question that is going to make them turn away and walk off. He knows their hearts and he knows what to say. And in this case, these people have their heart in alignment so well, all he has to do is say, follow me. Of course, being a tax collector, you're not very well liked by anybody because you're poor because of the tax collector stealing all your money. They were also dishonest. They were known for collecting more money than they should. And so they were not liked people very much. Levi had a home, which is a pretty big deal for someone probably that young and that single as Levi was. And a lot of people came, his, his work friends came, the tax collectors and other people were all reclining and the Pharisees and the scribes were out there saying, boy, this guy, he eats with tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus says, those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick, I have come to call the righteous. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Again, repentance, turn around, think again. He is not here for them. What I think is interesting about that sentence is, is that the Pharisees and the scribes also were not well. He's not saying, you're healthy, they are sick, they need help, you don't. He is saying, I came here for everybody. Everybody who needs help, which is everybody, everybody, I've come there for him. And uses, again, that doctor analogy. I think Luke would have liked that doctor analogy. He would understand it. It would have been scandalous, certainly to hang out with people who are such low lives as tax collectors. But Jesus didn't care about what other people thought. And Jesus cared about coming for the sick. So at the same time, there were disciples that said of John. And remember, John was Old Testament. He was a Nazarite. And he had an oath not to get married, not to drink wine. He was very strict in that Old Testament kind of way. And some of John's disciples came over and were ones that fasted often, it says, and offered prayers, just like the Pharisees did as well, very strict. And someone asked him, they said, we do this fasting and we do this praying as, well, just like the Pharisees do, but your disciples, they eat and drink. And Jesus brings that parable we heard before that you can't tell the wedding guests not to celebrate when the bridegroom is with them. I'm the bridegroom. I'm the reason for celebration. And there's going to be a time, you know, that he's not going to be there. And you can all mourn and fast and everything else when I'm gone. But right now, we're celebrating. And then he tells the disciples the parable about the new piece of cloth or the new wineskin. And no one drinking old wine wants the new wine. The, the old was good enough for me, you know, I think is what we're saying. And it's true. There was an old joke about, like, I forgot what it was, like a bunch of old pastors. How many old pastors does it take to change a light bulb? Five. One to change the light bulb and four to say they liked it better the old way. We all get stuck in our ways. And Jesus is trying to say, there is something new and expansive coming. Don't look to the old wineskins. Get a brand new wineskin where you can expand and grow with this brand new wine. It took me a long time of, of the other two Gospels to figure out what in the world that meant, but that's what it means. And that ends Luke 5. What I'm going to meditate on is this idea of Matthew's dinner with Jesus and how all these people who are considered to be undesirable were eating with Jesus and how stuck you get in that when you see something like that. When you go to church and maybe someone homeless comes into church and your first thought is, 
well, what's he doing here? Is he going to sit on our brand new chairs? Is he going to sit close to me and the guy doesn't smell all that good? Every one of us in every society has a group of people we don't think highly of and we don't think well of. And instead, we have to think that Jesus' message is for everybody. And we should be glad when we see anybody come into church and spend time with God in lessons and in prayer and in praise. It's easy enough, I think, to end up like the Pharisees wondering, why are those people hanging out with Jesus? They're the worst. They shouldn't be with a proper Jewish man. Yes, yes, they should be. My prayer is for those people who feel outcast in our society, don't feel like a part of anything. I think we can see it quite clearly when we look at the people who are homeless among us or people who are having a bad time in society, who are the downtrodden in our society, and not realize how poor of spirit, poor of power to change their lives, or poor in the just the regular sense of poor they are, and how our compassion should flow to them, just like Jesus had compassion for them too. And what I'm going to tell other people is that God came for everybody. But again, now it's not about Israel versus the Gentiles. It is not about the chosen people or the temple people or the church people, but it's also about the poor people. It's also about those who are powerless or those who are poor of spirit, where they just don't even have the willpower anymore to change their lives. Jesus came for them too. Everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to listen to my other podcasts and you can find all of them on the website, The Bible in Small Steps, or the main hub for all of my podcasts, a betterlifeinsmallsteps.com. All the links are in the show notes. Thank you so much.